All right, if uh, everybody has taken a seat, we're happy to start. So welcome to our training on the technical basis everybody should know before calling for regulation. Um, the moderation will be done by myself, I'm Nina, and Peter, who you see here, we are working for Center, and we'll also explain a little bit to you what Center is in the course of the presentation. So why are we having this um, presentation? Um, you will know that uh, in view of uh, the horrible terrorist attacks, many people talk about more responsibilities for internet companies. But we think that it's also important to understand what the different actors in the internet ecosystem do, what they're responsible for, and at which layer of the internet they are. So this is what we're going to um, explain a little bit today. Because uh, sometimes it's also important to know what's happening before you try to fix problems and you might break the internet. some practicalities beforehand, you will see some red pointers to certain policy issues. And uh, we were not going to go into the debates about them, but um, they might help you link to whatever else is discussed at Eurodic. So we will, we will, you will see some red boxes and they will refer to certain issues. Uh, when you can ask questions, given the high number of people in the room, and that's excellent news, um, we would like to ask you to keep your questions till the end. So we have an hour, uh, like half an hour for um, debate in the end, so you can um, just ask everything you want in the end. Uh, for later questions, you can drop us an email, and uh, just remember that this is a basic training, so obviously some corners were cut. So what is CENTER? CENTER is the Association for Exchange, Dialogue and Innovation of Country Code Domain Registries. So these are the guys that manage and operate the country code of their uh, top-level domains, so this is .uk, .fr, .si, .de, and so on. A little overview here, we have 54 full members, they also go beyond Europe. We have nine associate members, uh, also in Australia, for instance, New Zealand, and 13 observers, including people like ICANN and also the European Commission. Together they hold more than 73 million registered domains and this represents more than 50% of registered CCRTDs worldwide. 80% um, of our members are non-for-profit, that means uh, they are at the service of their local internet community. So basically the profits they make, they go back in, in the local community, for instance in education programs, conferences, sponsorship of national um, IGFs and so on. So what we do in terms of services, um, we help our members benchmark, improve their security, and also um, exchange best practices. So how do we do this? We have statistics that we provide them with about the market. We have a repository of presentations and uh, study papers and so on. We organize uh, events for them, so we have six working groups, and this was one of our bigger um, events where we have six working groups meeting at the same time and discuss issues from security to administration to technical issues and uh, further things. And we also have uh, some reports that we publish, and these might be interesting for you because they're public, publicly available and free of charge on our website. So what will you learn today? you will learn what the internet really looks like. It's not a cloud, it's actually um, pretty much hard stuff, so you'll learn about the infrastructure and the hardware. You will learn what IP addresses are, how they connect to each other, how networks work, how the domain name system works, why the root is important and why IANA matters, so that links a little bit to ICANN, who does what on the technical layers of the internet and why all of this uh, matters actually in internet governance discussions like the ones you have here at Eurodic. So uh, one example of how these things interconnect is a recent case that you might remember from October in 2016. Um, actually, the Ministry of the Interior asked the internet service provider, the ISP Orange, to block and redirect a couple of URLs. And what actually happened is that Orange had to do this manually, so they had to, um, uh, they had to do some settings in their, in their DNS server, domain name system server. And what happened is that there was a tiny human little error so that all the requests that went through to Google search actually were redirected to the Ministry of the Interior's own website. So basically they DDoSed themselves. So this is also one of the examples uh, that can happen when you try to fix something and then you might break other things. 
So this is a link to fundamental rights, obviously, because uh, obviously not all these requests were for illegal content, so uh, there's a risk of overblocking and also um, uh, censoring certain information that would have normally been normally available. So a little overview of where you are today in the internet ecosystem. Uh, you are first of all at Eurodic, obviously, in the upper left corner, and you're with us, with Centre. And uh, you see a division into the more visible upper part and the maybe a bit more lesser known and invisible technical layer, so the lower part. So this is where you are. So we have a lot of um, multi-stakeholder fora in this uh, area, ISOC, the users and policy developing organizations like ICANN, ITU. And uh, this is what you'll learn more about today, the technical layer. So the infrastructure, the ones who discuss standards and protocols, the numbering community, so the IP addresses, and the naming community, so the domain name system people. Yep. So this has, has a lot to do with all the multi-stakeholder fora that you will know of, also the ones today. This is why there's a little pointer to this. So what is the internet made of? It's made of carrots. And now you might wonder. Um, maybe you remember the little metaphor of the guy who is driving a cart and he has a mule. And in front of the mule, he has the carrots and he wants the mule to go faster. And if the mule doesn't react to the carrots, he will use the stick. But in the internet, we don't need sticks. We use the carrots. And that means basically that people agree on voluntary standards <clears throat> and protocols. So there's no sanctions needed, for instance, because people have an incentive to agree on these things and to find consensus on them, because the more people agree to a certain set of rules, the more can communicate and the more can interact. So this is important, obviously, for businesses, but also if you want to communicate to more people. So this has a link to standardization. So now, how does everything interconnect? So the internet is a network of network, and it started with four computer systems in uh, 1969, and now we have tens of billions of connected devices. So in order to um, illustrate that a little bit better, we take a journey through your networks and how you interconnect with the internet. So let's start in your office. So in your office, you will have your computer, and you log on, you, you link with a modem, and if you have more computers in your office, you will have a router. And this is actually what you see here. So this goes through the, your elevator shafts, your staircases, and so on. And it links to uh, the cables in the, in the ground, on the street, in front of your house. And this is then uh, converted to fiber optic cable. This is what you should see here. So that's the fiber optic cables in diameter. That's what they look like. Um, we've added this little slide because it means uh, obviously you not only connect to whatever is on the street and the street then goes to other distribution points in your vicinity, in your neighborhood, but obviously you also interconnect cities and that usually happens alongside railroads or motorways because it is the shortest distance from A to B. And obviously you also interconnect continents and that happens through undersea cables. These are huge cables that bundle other cables and uh, they, are also, they also have a protection layer because there's lots of things that can happen in the sea, more actually at the shore than in the deep sea. In the deep sea you might have an occasional shark that is biting at the cable, but more importantly at the, si at the shores there can be accidents with ships or some construction then they cut through the cables, that's why they need a big um, protection layer. And obviously there's also other means uh, than cables to connect you to the internet with uh, satellite or 4G. So this relates to the spectrum allocation uh, questions, radio frequencies that are used for mobile internet or TV broadcasting and so on and how they are used today and in the future. But obviously also other devices connect to the internet, so uh, we see some server cables here and obviously when a server is no longer enough for a company they have big data centers. Um, the ones that you see here for instance is the one of Facebook. So uh, I think I read somewhere that in 2010 they had 60,000 servers and now they're not even publishing the numbers anymore. 
Um, but uh, obviously they store all of these things in data centers. So these are huge facilities that have um, both computer and telecommunication systems and cooling systems and security systems because this is actually a very important um, part of infrastructure, so you need to have it properly secured. This links to the issue of privacy because you will, as a user, you will want your communication to be protected and that's actually uh, among the responsibilities of the telecommunication providers and the ones that have these data centers. It also links to the debate of the free flow of data because in some countries there might be obligations to have these data centers and or data stored locally. Yes, and actually with this I will hand over to my colleague Peter already. Thank you. So, um, Ina took you on a journey from your office desk to the um, router in the office, along the elevator shafts, on the streets, through the square where more and more cables connect across the ocean, through the air. Um, so, but we're, we're connecting devices. So, you, you see now, you have a you picture the um, physical infrastructure, the copper and the fiber and the network. That is a dead network. There is, so far, there is nothing happening on it. Now we want to make sure that all these devices, whether it's your laptop or your phone, um, your video recorder at home or, or your baby monitor even, your alarm system, that everything gets connected. In order to get connected, um, these things need to know, I'll just close the door. In order to be connected, these things need to know where to find each other. In order to find each other, they need an address. And on a technical layer, the first thing every device acquires when it gets connected is an IP address, an internet protocol address. What are these addresses? Um, they are identifiers. They're sequences of numbers. We'll get a bit later into the details, but you have IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, addresses, IPv6 are much longer. You'll recognize them right when you see it. And most of you are probably familiar with IPv4. Um, but we'll see a couple of examples later on. I will take a couple of exercises too. These addresses need to be managed. You cannot give the same address to more than one device because that would lead to confusion. So every device needs a unique address. And how do we get this organized? Well, there is one organization, um, IANA, who is responsible for chopping up an enormous block of all IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and handing huge chunks of those address blocks to different regions. And they give them to the RARs. And the RARs are the um, internet registries. They, uh, they are the regional registries for the numbers. And in Europe, this is RIPE. Um, and RIPE and CC then chops up that large block into still large blocks and hands them out to ISPs or academic institutions or governments or law enforcement or research institutes. Uh, IPv4 addresses, you still pay for them because there's a shortage. IPv6, um, there are plenty, so um, economic uh, uh, laws kick in and IPv6 addresses are pretty cheap. So with uh, RIPE, hands out these IP addresses in blocks to their members. So for instance, let's, call it, let's use an ISP or a mobile operator as an example. That mobile operator will then use an IP address to allocate to the device of one of their users connecting to their network. So the moment you switch your mobile on, your operator assigns you an IP address. The moment you switch on your laptop, you get assigned an IP address. But also on a lower level, and which hopefully none of you have to worry about. But when you're at home and you switch on your Wi-Fi router um, and your partner brings in a new device and switches it on, the router will automatically allocate an IP address to that device. An important thing here is that IP addresses can be static and they can be dynamic. Static, static, <coughs> static IP addresses are typically used for um, devices that are always online. A great example is um, one of these servers that Nina showed you earlier. Um, if uh, Facebook has a, a hosting farm, 
uh, that contains uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, data servers with all that wonderful information uh, on. Obviously, it always needs to be on. I mean, everything, every time somebody does a search on Facebook or wants to read a post, it needs to be available. So these devices typically have static IP addresses. Dynamic IP addresses were used at a time when IPv6 was still not fully uh, deployed. It still isn't. It's a long way to go, but it's getting there. But uh, there was a shortage in IPv4 numbers, so they were recycled. The moment you switched off your phone, somebody else got your IPv4 address assigned by the operator. So it was just a much more economic way of dealing with these addresses. Why is this important? And why is this technical knowledge important? Because a static address will mean that you can always identify the owner of that address. Um, a dynamic address, you would need to have the timestamp to know who was the person using that particular address at that particular time. So this is, this is an important thing. For those of you who have been following it, there is an inter a very interesting opinion from the Advocate General at the European Court of Justice, um, who three, four months ago, um, decided that dynamic IP addresses should also be considered to be personal data because they um, can be combined with other publicly available information sets today or in the future. Yes. This is not... Is this on? Okay, sorry. Louis uh, van Laan. I have a question because this is one of the things that, especially for law enforcement, uh, I think is, is very serious when there is a problem, something happens and they can trace whatever happens, whether it's a crime, a terrorism, jihadism, pedophilia, mm -hmm. something like that, to an IP address. Um, how can you then decide which person was behind that IP address so that you could then arrest them or, or just figure out who it was? That's a very interesting discussion. There are a couple of policy debates that, that are crucial there. On the one hand, you have the data retention debate. ISPs and telecom providers, they are obliged to keep specific sets of data, which is, amongst others, the access logs. And the access logs are IP address, timestamp, user. So through those access logs, you would be able to identify who used a specific IP address at a specific amount of time. That's data retention. Um, then there is much, an, there is increasing pressure on removing data, or at least keeping data sets for as short as possible, only for the fulfillment of the contractual terms. Um, there is security purposes too. But so there is a constant debate in Europe going on, as you very well are very well aware, uh, between those that believe that there is a need to keep those data sets longer, and those that believe that it should be kept shorter. Um, the same discussion is now raging in, in the US uh, after somebody got convicted over phone records um, that, um, and this brings it to the next level, but it's an interesting thing, where they uh, were able to trace somebody's um, route of robberies uh, based on his cell phone records. And this matches cell phone ID, IP address, and then distance between a couple of towers. So it, it adds a different layer. Um, in the Belgian government is just asking to um, increase the retention period to 10 years. Um, and that will obviously receive quite a lot of um, forceful feedback, uh, I think, from uh, some of the European institutions. So basically there's no technical um, uh, barrier to identify who, which physical person was behind which IP address, but then if I'm a criminal, I'm going to make sure that I mask my path. So how mm. do I do that? Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll show you at the end, in a way. Remember, and it might just have been before you came in, but um, as Nina mentioned, some corner corners are cut in this very basic training. There is one problem that is, um, it's called a network address translation, NAT, um, that on a carrier level, when traffic gets carried between different uh, carriers, um, they sometimes use the same IP address, at least from an external point of view, for different users. The reason why they do that is, again, um, using as few as possible. 
typically internally they are able to identify not just on a technical layer so that everybody gets the right type of content, but also, for instance, on a billing layer, they are able to identify those users internally, but it would show externally as one IP address. And so for a law enforcement agency coming up time and time again with the same IP address, no, there is no master criminal that does all the bad stuff in the world. It's probably a result of the network address translation problem on a carrier level. It's uh, referred to technically as uh, carrier grade net. I think you need to also mention that every network interface card has a that is the that is the MAC address. We're we're not going into that right now because it's not always used as well in the communication. So we're trying to focus on communicating between the different devices, but it's a very interesting point. Yes. IPv4, IPv6 addresses, um, as already mentioned to you, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Whenever you had a problem with your router and somebody was yelling at you to fix it because you're interested or working on something related to the internet, um, then these were the numbers you were typing in. Your job will get very much harder when your router will start using IPv6 addresses. Uh, but it is more stable, uh, it is more secure, uh, and there are plenty. We are running out of IPv6, uh, IPv4, sorry. So um, IPv4 is still compatible with all equipment, and that is sometimes a problem with IPv6. Older routers, uh, older, um, I mean, even the smallest uh, hubs in your home, uh, sometimes have trouble because the firmware has not been updated automatically, or you didn't bother for the last 10 years to do that. Uh, so sometimes you get into the trouble that there is a lack of compatibility. Um, I've been told by people who can know this much better than I, I'm a lawyer, by the way, I probably should have started with that. Uh, but then half of you would already have left the room. If you compare the number of IPv4 addresses to a golf ball, the proper uh, visualization of the number of IPv6 addresses is the sum. So that's the ratio. Um, and like with IPv4 addresses 20 years ago, today our technicians are confirming that we will never ever run out. So <laughs> how, how comfortable is that? So now to the more practical thing. So we now, we've done the, we've taken the journey from our office down to the street and to a different city and across the ocean. We know these devices have IP addresses, they have an address that identifies them. How do these addresses communicate? How do you get from address 192.168.1.1 to web server, which is its own unique address? Apologies for the kind of a Windows focused view. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, how does that actually work? How, what impact does that have on your connection? And uh, why do they none whatsoever. If properly configured, your system will use uh, the addressing that is most efficient, or least latency. Um, if you would connect your laptop to a network where there is uh, further down a problem with an IPv4 compatibility, uh, an IPv6 compatibility, then you might switch back to IPv4. So normally you actually don't see anything of it. You might, um, in one of the exercises that we're going to take in a minute, um, some of you might have different results because of the preference of IPv6 or IPv4. Um, but for further technical requirements or, or, or suggestions on how you would potentially change that preference or influence that, I would have to refer you to a more technically uh, educated person. And we, we know plenty in the center community. So if you, if you just... Uh, Get your contact details, I'll, I'll get you in touch. So if you, this is in Windows 9, this is Windows 10. Um, it's pretty easy to figure out the IP address of your machine. And I, I don't expect you to read that, but you can go to the properties of the device in uh, former Windows, um, or you look here into network connection details. Um, that's the easiest way, I think, these days to find it. So you have an, 
you find your IPv4 or, or IPv6 address of your own device. It's easy to identify. Same for your mobile phone. So then we want to connect to something. And the thing I'm most connecting to is the central website. So how do we figure out what the IP address is of the central website? Where can we find it? Well, there is a simple command. So in Mac, I think it's called terminal. Uh, the um, interface in which you can feed in commands. In Windows, it's the command prompt. So if you type in search com enter, and you get this old 80s style interface, which some of you might find exciting. Um, and you type in nslookup www.center.org. So that command, command will basically check the internet the name servers, and we'll get to that part, don't worry, um, and respond with an address. We can have two, because we have been well trained by our members and make sure that we have both an IPv6 and an IPv4 address. Um, well, maybe an exercise while we are at it, for those who have their laptops switched on and are in terminal or the command prompt. Um, what is the IP address of the EDRI, European Digital Rights website. Give you 15 seconds if anybody finds it. There's a prize. Anyone? Anyone working on it? Yep. We were told to make this a bit interactive, so this was one of the attempts. Um, so you, does, you do the name server lookup through the command prompt, and you get an uh, answer saying that the address of this website is 37 dot, etc., etc. Now a very important part, which will help you later on in the training. What happens when you type in this address into your browser? So forget about the domain name, no www.edri.org. But if you time that number into your browser, you'll get to the website. Um, remember that part when we're discussing blocking in uh, about 20 minutes from now. So we have two things now. Remember, I have the IP address from my machine through the Windows interface. And I have the IP address, two even, of the website, which we found through the name server lookup. So how do these two talk? How do they communicate? Any idea what this is? It's a prize. It's not a ball. <laughs> well, I, th I think we'll have to bring our prizes back home at the end. Right? <laughs> uh, this is the internet um, from a million miles high point of view. It's the connection of all the networks. Uh, it's properly mapped. Uh, the colors are the regions. Uh, so you see regions are not necessarily grouped together because the cable from British Telecom could connect easier maybe to a location in um, uh, Canada or, uh, or South America than to uh, Southern Europe. Um, so but this is what the internet looks like. Um, you see interesting things, like there is very specific concentrated bubbles. There are areas here, and you can't see that, but if you, the slides will be available later on. Right? Uh, but if you look at this area, it's almost closed off from anything else. So why would somebody want to connect to the internet, but not really? Why wouldn't you want to be somewhere here and have a thousand connections in all direct, in, in a thousand connections in, in all direction. Because these guys might be in military network. Um, and they typically are not too keen on having too many gates and doors to the rest of the world. Or a large academic research institute that is using millions of IP addresses to, to play a sandbox. And they have no need to have all of those communicate to the outside world. So, but it is an interesting picture. and and, and very specific things tell a story. Um, let's zoom in here. Oh, I already spoiled that one. So um, this, this is a standalone network. In, in some areas, 
uh, you see multiple connections, you see blurred networks that are almost interwoven, where they are not really standalone. Um, so what's the importance of those nodes? When Nina told you the story, we basically assumed that the whole telecom layer, from the elevator shaft cables to the street, to the railway road lines, belong to one entity, which is of course not the case. You have hundreds of thousands of communication providers, you have a couple of thousand large ones, and you have a few dozen giant ones in Europe, which is Telekom, Deutsche Telekom, and all the smaller ones. They need to connect those networks, and the more connections those networks have, the stronger this becomes. So your network becomes more resilient based on the number of connections that you have to other networks. So resilience is one, it's stronger. You have more options. If something goes wrong, you can go via another way to your destination. Secondly, it's also cheaper. Um, when I started working in the internet industry, I started working for a young Belgian ISP. It's called, it was called uh, Innet, UUNet. Um, half of our traffic that went through an other Belgian network went from Belgium to the UK to the US, where it got um, connected to a network from an other alternative operator, one of our competitors, was sent back to the UK, to Belgium, to be delivered on the incumbent's network, Belhacom. So when I send, an, at that time, when I send an email to my neighbor, the guy physically living next to our house, the email traveled for, well, roughly what, 12,000 miles? These days it's much better, because we have more connections. Connections are more local. And these connections, um, when they're formally structured and they're multi-peer, so more than two people connecting physically their networks, are called internet exchanges. And the more you have of those, the better. It's the reason why the digital economy in, um, the, in Europe and North America is much more developed than in developing countries. Um, and it's getting better, but it hasn't been too long that most of the African traffic went to the US and back, that most of the traffic in the Pacific Ocean went to the US or to Australia and back, rather than being uh, held locally. So stronger networks and cheaper. You don't have to buy as a carrier traffic that grows across the Atlantic. This is what it looks like, um, an internet exchange point. It's a German one. Um, I think this is a picture from their Frankfurt uh, location. Imagine a room where all the ISPs and telecoms have their own cupboard, roughly. Uh, some share, because it's cheaper. Um, they pay together for security and air conditioning and electricity. And then in the middle of the room, they physically pull their cables from one cabinet to the other, and that's how they're connecting their networks. They're adding security layers to it, and these, uh, these uh, internet exchange points. You have them in every European country. In most European countries, you have way more than one. Uh, even a tiny one like Belgium, I think, has four in the meantime. Um, so they're extremely useful. They are the crossroads of the internet. Um, and since they've uh, done a really successful job in, uh, in working smoothly, nobody has heard from them, which is the way that they probably want it. Um, yes, one of the important things is that um, th that's currently going on in Brussels, the NAS directive, of course. So it's an interesting discussion on what parts of that infrastructure are considered to be critical infrastructure. Um, uh, how can um, the different actors in the internet uh, improve, if possible, what they've already been doing? Um, what are the risks and what are the advantages of communicating on threats and vulnerabilities? Um, so plenty of interesting questions, but I think it's interesting to put a policy placeholder there. Now the next step. 
So we know how to identify these addresses. Um, we've seen how those, internet, those networks connect to each other on internet exchanges. But the fun part is that you can actually see how that traffic goes. So you can use, and we're just going to skip this exercise also in the, in the, for, for timing reasons. Um, but you can use a simple command, trace route, with a destination. And you will see in your command prompt or your terminal how the traffic travels across the world. So if you would, for instance, do this for nic.mx, which is a network information center in Mexico, you could see um, mainly IPv. It starts with IPv6, yeah, all, all the way. Um, but you see fancy places. You see how it travels to, uh, to Amsterdam, um, to uh, Boston, to Houston, and you really see it jump across the world. Uh, I've, I've made a somewhat clearer example, though much less exciting because it goes from Belgium to Belgium. Um, but it, it tells the story, the visualization that uh, Nina took you through. These addresses, so I did a trace route to our own website from my desk at the office. Uh, our website is uh, in Ghent, which is about 45 kilometers away from the office in Brussels. First thing it does, it jumps across the local network. Remember about those corners that were cut? In your network, behind your firewall, behind your router, you, will, you might be assigned the same IP addresses as at home. Um, so when I said IP addresses are unique, I should actually qualify or specify that IP addresses that are facing the internet are unique. Anything behind your own internal router, you can do with what you want. But they're assigned uh, automatically. So my laptop, um, probably the Wi-Fi. This could be our firewall. Um, we move on to the hub of Belhacom in our office. There's a, the modem of Belhacom. It goes down to, to the street. Here we're probably on the square, close to our office, uh, Frère Robin. Um, and these are all physical things that are standing there, but you, you see how it travels. Here an interesting one. Um, BNIX, it's a Belgian internet exchange, where Belhacom meets Eiffel Telenet. And there it ends up in the third cabin of Telenet. So Belhacom and Telenet exchange traffic in the Belgian Internet Exchange. And then it goes along, probably across one of these railroads between Brussels and Ghent, um, getting closer over Telenet's network um, to our host of our website, which is Telenet Customer. It's called, he's called, they're called Caracas. Um, and they rent server space with a company called Open Minds. Do that exercise with ex more exciting stuff, uh, uh, the S S Singapore, what is it, Times, or the Straight Times, a newspaper in Singapore, but from here, and you'll, you'll see your traffic jump across the world. Importantly, is if, the, if you do that exercise a minute later, or your neighbor is doing the same exercise, you might find different results here. And that is because, and we're not going into the technicalities of this, but that is because traffic will always find the most efficient, quickest route. So if there is somewhere traffic jam, it will just go somewhere else. And then you might see that instead of from here to here, they jump from here to somewhere else. Infrastructure, physical layer, IP addresses, they connect internet exchanges. You see now how the traffic, when you send a request across the internet, it jumps from one of these hubs to the next. So now, let's make it a bit more user-friendly. Let's add the domain name system. So why do we need it? How does it work? What is the root? And what is the implications on top-level domain policies? You all know this by now, IPv6 addresses, IPv4 addresses. But you wouldn't want to remember those when you want to send an email. Uh, or want to visit the website. Because importantly, well, most of these are uh, the most popular domains, or at least until a year or two ago, in, uh, in uh, some of the European member states. Um, but also uh, email servers have their IP address. So it's not 
just for web traffic. It's for any traffic, uh, whether it's uh, file downloads or FTP, if somebody still knows that, uh, or email. Um, this is an interesting one since, as you, I'm sure, all are aware, about five years ago, the um, DNS infrastructure um, became um, it became possible to register non-ASCII domain names, uh, which did make a lot of sense since about more than half of the world population could not use the DNS uh, without having to rely on alternative keyboards or alternative mechanisms to put input. So it's not just Cyrillic, um, it's 26 Indian scripts. Uh, oh, we have an expert in the room. Uh, I have I've lost track how many scripts are now uh, available as uh, IDN characters, uh, but I think it's pretty limitless. Uh, any script um, is uh, is now available, uh, and I know for the CCTLD world we have about 25 um, country code top level domains, so the equivalent to um, .rs or uh, .gr for the Greeks. We have about 25 equivalents in non ASCII characters. What's, what, sorry, there's a, there's a, somebody turned this on? Is that, okay. there, is a, there is a restriction in the sense that, of course, we only delegate new domain names into the root zone if there's no risk of confusion. And there are risks. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, obviously, but uh, certain characters in Han Chinese are identical uh, to Japanese. So if you delegate those, then you can actually have confusion. There are examples, and so there's, there's technical experts working on this, that if you type in, uh, in, in Arabic, your uh, name of uh, the IP ad, or sorry, the, the name of your, the website of your bank, and you do that in Pakistan, and you type in exactly the same name in the United Arab Emirates, you will end up at a different, uh, different location. So as long as there's that kind of confusion, uh, we have to make sure that we solve that. I was just at, at CDIG, so the Southeastern European um, uh, Internet Governance Dialogue, and there they have, uh, with Armenian, Georgian, and Cyrillic, there's very little confusability. Mm -hmm. um, so there it's working quite well. So the problem there with the new, these internationalized domain names, we call them IDNs, is that people don't know about them. Uh, and, and of course, uh, it would be great if we could get more introduction because uh, not only are there a billion Chinese and a billion Indians, even though there, there are hundreds of languages in India, so just mm. Hindi is not gonna cut it, but um, it, it would be so great to get more people online in their own language because then you don't have this constant flipping back and forth between your, uh, between sure. your keyboards. So if you wanna access the website of your Armenian restaurant in Yerevan, and you have to type it in in Latin script, it's just a hassle, and then the menu pops up in Armenian. So, so the more we can introduce this, yep. the better it is, but it's something where we really need to spread the news. They are available, it's a great way to get more people connected to the internet in their own language, um, but we have to resolve any underlying technical difficulties because you don't want any confusion. Yep. On, on the technical layer, so the addressing and the address translation, I think things are worked out and function well, and the registration uh, is, is possible. Um, there are still some issues on, on, this, on a software level um, or on a logic level. So you can have, you're the proud owner uh, or registrant, as we call them, uh, of an IDN domain. You want to reserve your airline ticket and the, air the airline company will simply not accept that your non-ASCII character email address is valid to register your uh, airline ticket to. So there's still a couple of issues on that level, and I believe that last year in particular there was quite some attention to that issue uh, at the global and the uh, regional RGFs. Uh, I've been told to hurry up a little. So um, why do we need uh, the DNS? Well, first of all, it's much more convenient to rem remember those addresses and email addresses, much better than IP addresses. It allows a flexibility. On a technical level, this is really important. Imagine that... Um, you have a server with an IP address and everybody is using that IP address to communicate. If something happens to that server, as in it burns down, and trust me, that happens more than you would think, um, they heat up and become incredibly hot. Um, if everybody communicates to that IP address, you would have trouble rerouting to a different IP address, assigning an IP address and then ev telling everybody, oh, guys, stop using the old one, we have a new one. If you're a newspaper with three million subscribers, that's not really scalable. As a newspaper, you just communicate your domain name of your website, 
Everybody knows the website. And they don't really bother with the underlying IP address. So if you would need to change the IP address, you can't do so without anybody noticing anything. So the domain name system provides you with an additional layer of stability uh, in, in making sure that people can communicate or reach your content. And then there is a, to a minor degree, there's also a, a security reason. You can use the DNS to divert traffic, malicious traffic. Everybody has heard about denial of service attacks. When these attacks are addressed at IP addresses, obviously the DNS doesn't help anything. But sometimes uh, there are combined attacks when the domain name is used as well as an attack vector, and the DNS can be used to divert that traffic to black hole. A really fun one um, that unfortunately I don't have much time to cover, it's Internet of Things. Fascinating stuff is happening on a member's level where um, European CCTLDs, and this is an example from .uk, uh, run Nominet, uh, is using the DNS to do fun stuff. Um, here they've built a prediction tool that will help um, uh, car drivers to avoid flooding. So they're using white space, um, that is the TV wave uh, lengths that are no longer used and that are free to use for R&D purposes in the UK. So they use that with an old antenna, you might not have seen this one for a long time, uh, connected to a modem, connected to a sensor that they hide in this plastic box and they just stick it, stick it on the bottom of bridges. And the only thing it does is it measures the distance to the water. If the distance becomes shorter, then they know that further down there might be flooding and it results in, uh, it's a smart city application, and it results in an open data project, and somebody with that data has built this. So you know where you can expect traffic jams, and um, the reason why the DNS comes into play here is that rather than giving your uh, devices an IP address, you can give them a name. You can give them the name of the bridge. And so people can easier understand where they're, what they're seeing. And the same thing for security purposes. Uh, if the water becomes too high and one of your sensors is flooded, you can immediately replace it and you don't need to change the name because you can change the IP address. Is it possible to play this movie? It's a one minute movie on how the DNS actually works. Other devices use IP addresses to identify each other on the internet. As we can't always remember complicated numbers, we use words instead. A domain name system brings the two together to get you to your destination. This is how it works. All around us we see domain names. For example, the website of your favorite band. The site is stored somewhere on the internet. Let me explain how your PC finds it within milliseconds. The journey starts with typing in the website address. In words, of course, as you wouldn't have remembered IP 88.151.243.8. Your device will read the address backwards. It will start at the end with the root domain, in our case, .eu. Information on the root domains is stored in 13 different root servers located around the world. In reality, there are numerous more copies of each of these machines in different locations to make sure that whatever happens, the system will keep on working. A root server contains the information on the name servers for the different zones. In our case, it tells us where we can find the information on addresses ending with .eu. Again, for reasons of security, there are a number of these .eu name servers located around the world, so that if one is too busy or stops working, for example, due to an earthquake, the information would still be reachable elsewhere. The .eu name server knows where the information for the more than 3 million .eu addresses is stored and will tell us where we can find flamingflamingos.eu it will communicate this unique IP address. The IP address for the Flaming Flamingos website is now identified and sent to your computer. Now the download of the content can start. But remember, this whole process that makes it possible to connect your computer to the place where the website is stored happens in just a few milliseconds before it connects to the internet and starts downloading the information. In reality, a lot of information is stored along the road in the so-called cache memories, so that the information can be retrieved faster than having to return to the root every time. This movie is brought to you by Center, the organization of European country code top-level domains.
All right. Goeie vraag, Henry. Um, so, the short movie, and there's a lot of information packed in there, but remember one thing, it's hierarchical. So we added the DNS as a convenience to human users, but it makes it a bit more complex for the system itself, because now, rather than the simple IP address, which it knows where to find, it serves a domain name, which it still has to look up. And so the movie basically explains how that lookup look happens. And you start on the right. Um, has anybody heard about the hidden dot? I see one dot. Watch out. <laughs> so the, the hidden dot is actually the dot that you never type. When you go to a website, you would actually have to type www.center.org. There is a final dot at the end. But our system knows that we are lazy, and so it adds it automatically. And that final dot tells your browser to start looking at the top level, which is called the root. And the root will have information about where to find, in our example, .org. When you have that address, your system will then query the name servers of .org where to find center. And it will query our own servers where to find our World Wide Web, www site. So it's a hierarchical system. The information on the different levels is spread. It sounds complicated, but it has an enormous advantage. It means that not a single entity is in control of all this information. It makes it much more secure and much more stable. Well, hang on, you might say, who is in control of the root? We'll get to that. It's a multi-stakeholder model. It's an organization called ICANN that I think most of you will probably be familiar with. Um, so it is a hierarchical system, and every layer holds information on the information below it. Yes? Yes. These sites are, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they are with a, on the end is a dot onion or something like this. Are these sites also found by DNS, or do you have to actually have the IP address and addresses directly? Um, you can, when we use the name servers, which are typically built into your, um, well, the software is built into your system, in your browser, in your operating system. It's what your ISPs are working with. But you can use alternatives. These alternatives will not be as efficient. They're very vulnerable to hijacking, so tread at your own risk. But indeed, there are alternatives ways in which you can type in addresses that are resolved in different ways that might end you up on places like the dark net. Uh, but these do not use the regular domain name system. So there is no entity that holds the uh, zone file for .onion. That one is shared by a multitude of users in a peer-to-peer -peer system that is probably or already starting to move towards more blockchain-based uh, systems where there is no central authority. But with all prob problems that follow from it, it also means that there is no community-driven policy that says, well, we can accept that and we don't do this. Um, they, there is no conflict resolution mechanism. First come, first served. If you happen to have registered Coca-Cola.onion, then there is no way that could be. I'm not making any judgment call on whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I'm just saying that regular rules would not apply. In a DNS system, the policies are based on um, typically local discussions on a national level between internet users and businesses and government too on um, what is acceptable and not. We'll go into some of these a bit more in detail, but you understand the hierarchy of this. The root has information on the different top-level domains. There is a U and EE for Estonia and .com. These days, there's also .brussels and 1,800 additional GTLDs. Um, not all of them are very popular. On the next level, and I zoomed in on .eu here, .eu name servers, will have information on where to find Europa.eu, Eurit, which is the manager of .eu, uh, Euractiv, which is one of the newspapers, uh, news sites, um, and um, 
again, down one level to the domain server. Um, Europa.eu will hold information on Korea.europe, uh, Europa.eu uh, for the uh, European Court, um, EC for the Commission.europa.eu, SMTP.europa.eu for when you're sending an email to one of the um, people working at the Commission. So all this information is here, all this information is here, all this information is there. Who does what? Who are the entities? Ayana is the Ident as the entity, and remember, we they also do the handing out of large blocks of IPs. They do two things, well, three things, but let's forget about the third one, it's not that important. Um, but the two main important things they do is they hand out large blocks of IP addresses and um, they manage the root zone. And I'm sure some of you are curious. So, the third thing they do is they, they hold a repository of standards, very technical things that you're a laptop will check to use specific formats for time, for instance. All right. um, so on the top level domain, it's the top level domain registry. Every top level domain has one and only one registry that manages that uh, specific zone file. And for .eu, it's an a registry called URIT. In most European countries, it's a, a multi-stakeholder, not-for-profit organization. Um, I would say that in 80 or 90 percent of the cases, they are spin-offs from universities. In the 90s, universities were asked, do you want to uh, manage your country's zone file? And said, yes, fine, sure, why not? And that became a rhetorical question when they suddenly started to get flooded with 10,000 of requests per day of people that wanted the domain name. And universities were uh, not well equipped to deal with the admin, and they didn't have the tech uh, nor admin support. So they outsourced that. There's typically still partners in those ventures. The one I'm most familiar with is uh, .be. Uh, that was a spin-off from the University of Leuven. Uh, and where you have uh, the internet service providers, the users, uh, the government and the, um, a, a large industry federation uh, running this together on a not-for-profit basis. Then on the next level, for instance, the center level, it's our domain administrator. For us, that's outsourced, and that's the guys doing our hosting. Um, the least impressive picture in this whole presentation, this is what the root zone looks like. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm doing some of my colleagues uh, not, not, a, not, a, not a favor. Uh, you obviously have uh, nicer, uh, nicer looking examples. But it's not that impressive because it does a very simple job. It needs to be done well, but it does a very simple job. The root zone has a list of roughly 1,800 top-level domains. And when everybody, whenever somebody asks, where can I find this particular top-level domain, it responds with an IP address, and that's it. And 1,800 lines in a database is nothing in today's age. So it's more about network um, loads than, than about being able to answer specific queries. As I already mentioned, IANA manages the root zone. The root zone is a file, and it's, um, it's derived from the root zone database. The root zone database contains more information than just the zone file. As I mentioned, the, jo the zone file tells you this is a name, and you can find it at this IP address. In the database, you add additional layers. Who runs it? So there is a name of a person who is the technical operator, who is the administrative contact. Where can I call them? What is their address? Um, if they have more than one name server, which they really should, uh, then this is the list of their name servers. So that's all in the database. So the file is much shorter. Obviously, there is not one single file in the world that everybody queries. Um, they've distributed it, and it's copied. So there are 13 identical copies. For each copy, and it sounds a bit like Lord of the Rings, but for each copy there is one um, well-established organization responsible uh, for maintaining its security and integrity. And everybody trusts that organization, and so in Europe we have two organizations that have a copy. It's RIPE, the guys who hand out the IP addresses, and NetNot, uh, one of the uh, major uh, providers of uh, security solutions. Um, uh, and um, for, for, for the technical operators. 
And then those 13 copies get many, many, many more copies. Uh, because there, as remember the carrot story, there is an incentive to have a copy. If I'm an ISP and have a million users, and all these users would every time have to query one of the copies, for instance, in Amsterdam of the route, I'm paying for a lot of traffic back and forth from Brussels to Amsterdam, or from Madrid to Amsterdam. Um, if I have a copy of that zone file, which I can uh, get a fresh copy every half an hour or every hour, um, then every time somebody queries, I can provide the response without having to go all the way. So it's, it's more efficient. It's a carrot. For example, four of those copies are hosted in Brussels. Very importantly, that root zone database was overseen by the US government until last year, October 2016. Um, the US government handed out that oversight to a multi-stakeholder community that groups within ICANN. So it is um, the combination of the CCTLDs, the generic TLDs, the users, uh, the governments, um, the technical operators, the security and stability committee. So there is a, a lot of people um, who uh, now decide jointly on how to manage that zone file. Before that, if any change was needed, the NTIA had physically, literally, to approve that um, by uh, sending an OK confirmation. A snippet from the zone file, see it doesn't look that interesting, but it tells you where to find the zone, the name servers for URIT. Uh, URIT is doing a really good job. They have about 10. Uh, they have IPv4, they have IPv6. Uh, and uh, they, if you would trace those, they're spread all across the European Union. So well done. Uh, here you see Eurovision, which is just the next record, the next name serving record, in, uh, the next uh, name record in um, the uh, root zone file. You have two types of top-level domains, country codes and generics. Quite self-explanatory. Um, there are many more new GTL GTLDs these days. CCTLDs are restricted. Only countries that have a code on the ISO 3166 Alpha 2 list uh, can get delegated a country code. Very important that this happens here because you would not want any other organization but a UN agency to deal with or to decide on which is a country and which is not. So this is not a discussion that takes place in ICANN. If I'm separating a small community from the Belgian federal state, um, it's not ICANN that I should ask for permission to get my CCTLD. I should first convince the UN, and if the UN puts it on the list, then ICANN has a pretty easy job when managing the zone. The most important difference, of course, is that these are managed locally. They serve a local community. They serve that community based on its values and the way it expressed those values and local court decisions too, which typically and normally should reflect those local values as well. GTLDs, they run under a uniform contractual policy that is decided by that ICANN multi-stakeholder community. Um, so it's not a matter of ICANN organization, the 300 people that are working there that make these policies, but it's the community that builds these policies. As a result, these policies are global. And GTLDs, they pay a fee to ICANN, which is probably, which, not probably, which is ICANN's main source of income. Interesting discussions on the Cyrillic and Greek.eu. On GTLDs, when we're thinking about polar discussions, we're thinking on .wine and point vin, uh, which triggered a really interesting discussion. And I can, um, if I have champagne, champagne point vin, or champagne .wine, does that mean that I'm the official? I'm officially entitled to start deciding on which wines can register on the third level? And is, is there a, is this a proof of concept for a new geographic indicator system? Um, so interesting policy discussion there. So we were at the first level, right? That hidden dot, and that told us where to find EU. When you then go, you have 
the zone, the root zone told us where to find .eu, we go to the next level, so the .eu at the end. What does that tell us, um, and where do we find that information? Uh, there is a who is. Every registry runs a who is. That has obviously privacy implications. Um, the historical reason for the who is is if something went wrong with a website, you knew who to contact. Hey, your website is down. Well, you probably couldn't write an email if their system was down, but you could have called them because there's a phone. There's a fax, even. So um, that was the initial purpose of the who is. Now it's more used to, I'm interested in buying your domain, or there's something on your domain that I don't like and I want to, you to remove it. But who is is a useful tool to facilitate that communication. If you zoom in, uh, you find these, uh, these technical details. It also contains, remember the hierarchical system, where to find the information of the system below. And so uh, this is for Europa.eu, with all the name servers, again, uh, IPv6 and IPv4 addresses. We're almost there. We're going to the, I'm not going to redo the movie, but we come into some interesting cases here. So we're looking for example.eu. Um, this is inconvenient. <laughs> we'll see if we can get it fixed, otherwise I'll try to talk you through the last couple of slides without the animation. Say around 40. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So the question, so you type in a name, it first goes to your access provider and it asks for the IP address. The access provider has a machine that's called DNS Resolver that does that part of the work. Its workload is spread, so answering questions goes to the DNS Resolver. Um, the DNS Resolver asks um, where .eu is, right? It responds with an address. Then it queries the .eu registry for example.eu. Responds with an address. Example.eu is queried where to find the web server as opposed to, for instance, the email server. Responds with an address. And there we are. So we, know, we now know where to find information and the traffic begins. So DNS is no longer relevant. How does blocking work? There's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, but all as I hope you, I will be able to show are rather inefficient. So you ask that question to your access provider, and your access provider has been told by the government, if anybody asks, don't tell. I mean, just don't respond. Ignore the question, which is quite often what happens when you get a 404 page. In most countries, I don't know about this one, in mine, when you go to the piratebay.se, um, you get a 404 response, or you get diverted to the law enforcement website. So... Um, what else could happen? That is, the access provider provides you with a wrong answer, and this is the di redirection that we get. So it provides you with an IP address that it knows is not the real one, um, but it sends you to a police-controlled server, and that one will then uh, provide you with an answer saying you're trying to reach information that is illegal or the, based on a court order. So it will provide you with information and serving you a, um, a proper notice. Why doesn't this work? And there are, there are a couple of other blocking techniques, but why doesn't this work? I think, remember that exercise when I looked for Edry's IP address? And then when I typed in that IP address into my browser, I just got to the content without the DNS. So that is obviously the main reason why the DNS is not a 
communication tool. It is a facilitator. It helps you memorize IP addresses. Uh, it helps you memorize an address without having to know the IP address. So remove the DNS from the whole system, and it would become pretty annoying to use the internet or sending emails, but it would still go. You would even shave off the three milliseconds that it takes to do the query, uh, but it would probably take you longer to type that in. So um, the easy way of circumventing DNS blocking is by just simply changing the domain name. It will take you three minutes and cost you, depending on the domain, um, around five euros. And so if www.example.eu is blocked, you just use a different language. You use Vorbild or uh, Beispiel or Ejemplo.eu. So you register a different domain name, you link it to the IP address, and because the system was built to be resilient, it works. I mean, that's the whole reason why we have the DNS. Remember the security part there. So blocking on that level doesn't make sense. So can, can you explain this again? Because w one of the things that the law enforcement people say w is a problem because people don't understand how the internet actually works is that, so there's a domain which somehow violates uh, the law, um, and then they take down the domain, but since the IP address is still there, you can basically then put a different domain name and then still end up going to the same IP address. Of course, yes. And taking down the domain, uh, we'll get, we might get to that if we have some more time, but taking down the domain uh, because the, uh, the domain infringes the law, it makes as much sense as removing a street address because the street address infringes the law. It can't. It's an address. It's what's happening in the house that might be illegal. But removing the address or tearing it out of a, 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 a phone directory or wiping it out from Google Street's view doesn't make the place go away or make the illegal activity stop. It, it is what it is. You make it hard to find an address, but nothing more. Um, but indeed, if you would respond with a false address, so keep on saying, no, example.eu doesn't exist, then if the people running example that you think it's really important that their contents remains online for freedom because they think it's important that society understands what they want to share with them, then they just take a different domain, they link it to the IP address. Most often, to be resilient, um, these, dom these sites already have multiple domains without anybody taking or blocking one of them. So, uh, yes, we already did that trick. So you type in the IP address into your browser rather than the domain name, and you have direct access to that server rather than to jump around uh, asking where to find it. You don't need the domain name resolver. Um, many companies, larger ones, um, run their own DNS resolver. So they would not, when the law, uh, when the government courts law enforcement, tell the access provider to make their domain name server resolver lie, you don't need to use that one. Most people do. It's automatically in your browser. You can, I think I even have a screenshot uh, there. But uh, you can change that one. You can use your own, or you can use, for instance, Google's. Google is very simple to remember. It's 8.8.8.8. Make, change your DNS resolver to Google's 8.8.8.8.1 and none of the local law enforcement instructions to the ISPs will have any effect on you. And by the way, we keep on telling that story to law enforcement agencies too. I mean, we're not trying to, cir to circumvent or undermine the really good work they're trying to do. We just want to make sure that they understand that what they're doing does not always make sense from a technical perspective. So yeah, this is an example where you basically have not the DNS resolver, but your own resolver answer those questions. And the result is the same. Use part, yes, oh, here it is. Uh, third party DNS, they're plentiful. Uh, some of them are more trustworthy than others. Remember, Google is not a charity, so they are very happy for you to use their name server resolver, because every time you ask them a question, they know that 
this is the type of traffic that you want to start. They know that this domain is quite important because many users are asking for it. It probably adds to their algorithms and increasing the value of that domain and putting it hang higher in their ranks. So they have a purpose for doing that, but it is a technical... Um, it, is, it is possible to easily change that and, and use uh, alternative uh, addresses. I'm sure that if you would ask EDRI, uh, they could provide you with third-party organizations that will not abuse the traffic logs that your queries generate. Yeah. So we went through this. Same thing, different access provider. Oh, uh, yes, one more. Web proxies. Um, you could use some websites to change the course of your traffic by going through that website, typing in the address that you really want to reach, something somewhere else, and then that website is going to fetch that information for you. So practically, if on a local level, there is a block, an access, an access block. Um, you are not visually or visibly looking for that information. You're looking for that third-party website, proxy.example. They look like this. Again, obviously, they abuse your traffic. Um, they find it very interesting to know what you're looking for, what you're doing, um, and that information is most likely being sold when it's a free one. You can pay for more established um, ones that are probably a bit more trustworthy. So I would definitely not recommend to use proxy servers, but it's a, a way that some people uh, avoid um, blocking, traffic blocking. And it's a proxy.example that is then going to ask for example.eu. And you see that none of this querying traffic and back and forth goes over this line. So whatever is blocked here on a national level, um, has no impact. And then you just end up to the example of the EU website. Different things, gentlemen already mentioned to um, the, uh, the darknet, uh, typically uh, accessible through alternative browsers like Tor. What Tor does is it's based on a proxy principle, so it is not you going to specific content, to fetch specific content, but you ask a second person to do that for you. It's actually way more complicated than that. You ask probably a dozen or 20 people to do that for you, and one just asks a colleague the same question. It goes a bit slower, but it is almost untraceable of who is looking for what content. Um, Tor is the onion routing, um, and it does perfectly what it describes. It builds sh layers uh, of shields around the person asking for specific content or the identity of a person that is communicating with somebody else because you keep on passing on the traffic until everybody has lost track on who the original question came from. You just know that when you get an answer from whoever you ask, you pass it back to the one who asked the question to you, um, and that's basically it. Uh, one swarm, it's a bit less popular already. These slides are less than a year old, uh, so times, uh, things go fast, but one swarm uh, is a peer-to-peer uh, -peer based dating sharing system that would allow you to store information, to have it accessible without uh, easy identification. So conclusion on the blocking. Um, blocking is a technical term and it describes a procedure. We block. It does not provide an outcome, pr uh, describe an outcome because actually we try to block, but we probably hardly ever succeed. I think there's a big difference in preventing users from accessing something accidentally. The type of reaction that you get is, I really didn't want to see that. And trying to prevent users that want to access content. Typically, Pirate Bay users do not end up there by accident. So we can try whatever we want. There are plenty of mechanisms that are easy to circumvent, or that are easy to use to circumvent roadblocks on the way.
So um, what we strongly believe, and this isn't like, the, obviously the, the training was more than just about blocking, but I think it's a good example to link to the technical understanding on how things work. But um, education is crucial. I mean, we keep on educating law enforcement agencies and uh, commission officials. We give this training to the commission, to the parliament, um, and to, um, to other stakeholders in Brussels to inform the debate. Remember this one that Nina started you with? So now you understand what happened, right? The French government told French ISPs and mobile operators on a Monday morning. This is a list. They do that every Monday morning, by the way. So on, on a Monday morning, I think October last year, they sent them a list of sites to block. It's a manual thing, so most of the operators took the list, they looked at it and said, uh, Google is in here and Amazon is on there and Twitter, maybe that's not the right list. And they asked and said, oh, no, no, it's not the right list. One of the operators didn't check whether it was the right list. <laughs> and um, they blocked uh, Google amongst quite a few others. OVH was one of the largest, most popular French sites, was part of that blocking list too. Apparently it was some sort of test list that had accidentally slipped. Um, but the result was that all traffic, or most of the traffic, was diverted uh, to the French Ministry of Interior Affairs. Um, so they uh, accidentally committed digital suicide. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that um, it's a perfect illustration on how dangerous it is to mess with the technical layer. Um, and if people want to do so, they should be properly informed and understand what the impact is and be well aware of the uh, societal, economical, and political risks. Once you start mingling with the system, it might be vulnerable to capture or to mistake, as we've seen here. Another one, with no time for that, unfortunately, is WannaCry was stopped because they used the DNS as a kind of a, a check, a safety check. If an a uh, researcher would have taken WannaCry and put it in a box and closed it from the outside world, then there wouldn't be any connection possible with the DNS. Um, by registering a name, all the, um, all the viruses that were out in the wild checked whether the name was still available. It wasn't. So they thought they were in a box and they shut themselves down. So it was a, an interesting um, flaw in the software where um, the, uh, the researchers definitely outwitted the, uh, the virus writers. It was, a, it was a really nice thing. But so there the DNS plays a role. You see it quite often that there's a, a link to the DNS. And I hope that today's uh, training, although ridiculously short, um, helped you a little bit with that. So time to wrap up. You wouldn't believe it, but we probably spoke about almost everybody on this list, at least in the technical layer. So on infrastructure, the network operators, the guys with the cable and the fiber, root servers, uh, the, the one in Frankfurt we saw, uh, internet exchange point, uh, hosting providers, the, the large cabins, uh, the, the, la the racks that uh, Nina showed you in the data centers, domain name registry, CCTLDs and GTLDs. We're center, so we're hosting all European CCTLDs. Uh, we discussed ICANN and all the constituents, CCNSO, GNSO, governments, so users, security. We discussed the naming community. We focused on the European one, RIPE. Um, we have uh, formerly known as IANA, now PTI, pu Public Technical uh, Identifiers, identifiers um, that hand out the names and the numbers, and they do a bit of protocoling too. These guys, we, and it's shameful, but we didn't really discuss them, but they are setting the standards. They're the real heroes of this whole story. These are engineers, half of them, trust, believe it or not, doing this in their spare time. They take a holiday for that. And they go to an ITF meeting, and there for four, five, six, seven days, they discuss on how to build the next standard to have your IP traffic flow smoothly across the world. Um, they're doing incredible work. There are a couple of organizations that work on that. So ITF is probably the main one. Internet Architecture Bureau is the other one. Um, W3C sets the standards. So for instance, accessibility of a browser. There is no government deciding on that. There is W3C saying, uh, for visually impaired, this is how we're going to build the standards. If your website wants to be 
accessible to the visually impaired, follow these standards and it, it will work. It's a carrot again. If you don't, nobody cares. Well, probably the visually impaired care a lot. But um, if you don't, you don't get punished. You're just missing out on a potential opportunity. So but these standards bodies, I highly recommend you to look into it and how it works. It provides fan fascinating uh, examples of um, governance stories. Um, in ITF, they, they, well, it's not that common anymore, but to, to reach consensus or to confirm consensus, there's a humming sound going around the room. Uh, rather than voting, or, and if some people don't hum, then it, they don't agree, but if the humming is, humming is overwhelming, then there, it seems to be fair that, to conclude that there is a standard set. Um, there are more detailed and fine-tuned ways of coming to consensus on some of the more delicate uh, discussions, by the way, but just as an example. Uh, there's a great document, uh, ITF Tao. Read it if you want to understand how it works. It's a perfect primer, and whenever ITF is, uh, is next to you, try to, to get in. ISOC provides uh, tickets, I think. Is anybody from ISOC here? I think ISOC still provides uh, access. ISOC, the Internet Society, which is... Here, Internet Society. Um, they provide sponsorship to ITF, IAB, and other standards bodies, and the ISOC chapters. So they're doing a great job. If you're wondering where ISOC gets its money from, .org. Every .org domain that gets sold, significant amount of that fee goes to ISOC. And there's also fees from uh, the chapters, of course. If you're an ISOC member, you pay a fee. Carrots, very important. Never forget it. Uh, standardization doesn't work. If 15 years, no, if 30 years ago, the ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, would have sat down and said, guys, let's build the internet, I'm pretty convinced that today we still wouldn't have it. Uh, and I'm not making fun of them, but it is just a mechanism that is not fit for quick adaption to modern needs. Um, with the way that the internet was built, so without formal standardization, but built on carrots, things moved very quickly. We learned on how you can trace your routes and travel the world. If you're really bored at home and you want to visit another place, go trace routing and uh, you'll, you'll see places. Um, why we need the DNS? It helps, useful for users, build some security into it. Um, it's an old view on the same thing, uh, but uh, it's a hierarchical system. Every layer controls its own information, so there is no central point, uh, and that one point that rules all the top-level domains is managed by multi-stakeholder organization. So some corners were cut, so, um, but everything that I've told you is, uh, was confirmed as accurate by uh, our technicians. Um, Malcolm Hattie provided from links, and he is around, so if you meet him, say hi, and thank him for these animated slides at the end. Um, they make it quite useful. So thank you. I don't know if we still have time left. Do we have time for questions? No. <laughs> All right, but we're still around. Um, feel free to drop by. Thank you so much.